بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم الحمد لله رب العالمین الرحمن الرحیم مالک یوم الدین لا اله الا الله محمد رسول الله I declare that there is none worthy of worship other than Allah and that the Prophet Muhammad is the final messenger of Allah. You see, every Muslim, we declare this and we believe it and we try to, as much as possible to live this. And this is the way that we should all be. All human beings on earth should realize that there is only one God. And if we get distracted from this, then we need to find our way back. So today's title of the series that you're going to be watching, inshallah, in the next few days is entitled Cold War. And there is a Cold War going on that we often forget about. And this Cold War is between the enemy of Islam and Islam. You see what happened during the Cold War when, uh, if you speak to your parents or those of you are old enough, will remember the Cold War was when people were afraid of saying things or doing things because maybe somebody would push the button and we'd all be exterminated from planet Earth. Well, this Cold War is not about who's going to push the button and who's going to exterminate one group from another. This is about finding out the truth and finding out what is available in our arsenal that we can have to bring other people to the truth. You see, during the Cold War, the Russians thought they were the right ones, and of course, the Western world thought they were the right ones, democracy versus communism, things like this. Today, we are going to look at two different, uh, inshallah, in the next few episodes, and today, we're going to look at the two opposing forces that we see in the world today, and that is Islam and Christianity. But before I tell you about the Quran and the Bible and we look at this Cold War situation that we're living in today, let's have a look at how I personally came to Islam. And why would somebody, seemingly normal white guy, European, Caucasian guy, coming from a normal middle class family, what would attract him to Islam? And so I'm going to give you a little bit of a, a background on why I chose Islam. And inshallah, I'll be able to explain to you why this war is so important that we are now in. Not a war between Christianity and Islam, but a war of truth. The war of showing people that there is only one way, and the way is only found by full submission to the will of Allah, and Allah alone. So, how did I come to Islam? Well, this used to be my Bible. This is the Bible that I believe to be uh, the book that contained the information on how you could live a good life. And as you can see, this is a, a well-used Bible. It's the New International Study Bible. And you can see that on the side of it, it says, Jesus loves me. And this is something that I bought into, believed. You can see it's well marked. All the passages have been marked in, in different colors so that I'd find my way around it. So this is a book that was well read. There's notes written all over the place. And so this is a book that I really followed and believed in. But the way I came to Islam was actually by reading the Bible for the first time. You see, I had many years I had grown up with the Bible I had read the Bible, I had studied the Bible, I had gone to courses, I had attended workshops about the Bible, and I really thought that I had an understanding of this book. But it was only when I actually began to read the Bible that I started to find that, wait a minute, there are things that we as Christians are practicing that are not contained inside this book. And there are things that we should be practicing that are contained within inside this book. And so the conflict began. So when I was a Christian, as a Christian, I would say to myself, but why is it like that? Why is it that the church and the practices of Christianity are so far away from the teachings of the Bible, yet there are other teachings that we get out of the Bible that have nothing to do with Christendom at all? These are totally taken out of context. They have nothing to do with us. Why are we following this? And so what I began to discover is that I had a problem between faith and the real meaning of the Bible. Now, what is faith? We're often told in Christendom, we're often told in other religions in the world, we're told what faith is. They say faith is believing in the unseen. In other words, blind faith. You don't know what it is, but you just believe it. So many times people would say to me, you must just have faith. We don't know how to explain these doctrines. We don't know how to explain these beliefs. There's no real evidence from the Bible for these beliefs that you have. You must just believe it by faith. But you see, when I came to the Quran, and this is skipping ahead in time, when I came to the Quran, they said to me the same thing. But what they said to me when I came to the Quran is said, you believe by fact. Here's faith based on fact. Here is faith based on what we do not know. And so I looked at it this way. This is how I understand faith to be. Faith is going to a car dealership with your son, or maybe you go with your father to a car dealership, and they have all these beautiful cars there. There's BMWs, and there's Mercedes, and there's VWs, and all the different cars, no matter what car you like. And now there was this beautiful car that you saw, and you said, this is the car that I want. And so you choose this car. The car dealer comes up, and he has a piece of paper in his hand, and he takes a pen, 
and he fills in a contract and he says, this car is now yours, 100% yours. There, he's done the registration for you. He's filled in all the details that are required for you to take this car from the dealership. All the monies are transferred into the accounts of the dealership and you take ownership of the car. He gives you the keys and he says to you, if the car breaks down after 100,000 miles, 100,000 kilometers, this car is under warranty, it's under guarantee, it's yours, uh, we'll repair it. So you've got all these guarantees, you've got all the warranties, you've got the car keys, you've got this car, everything is sorted out. Now faith is climbing into the car. With all the evidence, with all the information in front of you, everything that you need to know, then you start the car and you drive off. That is faith. You see, faith that I had when I was a Christian was telling me with all, all the same story exactly. So the story that I had when I was a Christian was the same story exactly. However, when I got to put the car keys in, I found that I only had a bicycle. And so for me, there was a huge difference between what was told to me to be true and what I found to be true in the documents itself. So I began to question the church doctrines. I began to search the scriptures and try to see how these two related to each other. I found conflicts of interest between many of the teachings. And then as the years went by, I felt myself being called by God to a purer sense of religion, a purer sense of my belief. Now, I won't say a purer sense of Christianity because I didn't know what to call it at that time. I believed I was a Christian and I believed I was following Christianity, but I found myself being pulled more towards obeying the law of God. I understood that we are saved by grace, as Christians said. I understood that there's nothing I can do to win God's favor. I understood that. But there was something inside of me as a Christian that was pulling me towards obeying obedience. I felt that just by saying a few magic words wasn't going to be enough for me to find paradise. Wasn't going to be enough to ensure that I would one day be in heaven. So I felt myself going more and more towards obeying the law. And I, when I spoke to Christians or other people or scholars in Christendom about this, they would say to me, you know, you're saved by grace. You don't have to worry about the law. You can have a salvation apart from the law. But as I started looking at the scriptures myself, I found that God was calling me. I could feel that there was a definite call to go towards understanding the law. And so I began a, a study. And this study was to search through the scriptures, through this book, and underline or circle anything that I did not understand, anything that I had a problem with, anything that there was not concrete, absolute evidence for. In other words, if they said that, it, that a chicken or a fowl or a, an, an animal had four legs, is there such an animal on planet Earth today? And if there wasn't, then I would circle it and put an X next to it and say, not known, an unknown. X means the unknown. That's why I remember you had uh, programs called the X-Files. It was the unknown information. And so what began to happen with me is I began to create my own files. And excuse me a moment, I just want to pick it up for you. I began to create what is called the cold case files. And I have in South Africa, where I come from, a room that's about three meters by three meters by three meters. It's quite a large room. And in this room, I have cold case files like the one that you see before me here. And in this cold case file are mysteries that are unable to be explained within the books of the Bible. And within the books of the Bible that I studied, I found many doctrines that were unable to be explained. Doctrines like the Christian family and what is Christian, how should a Christian family be? Should we be able to uh, have male-female relations? Should we be able, to be able to meet people without having uh, somebody chaperoning us? How's the right way to get married? All these type of things. Christian relationships with God. The how, what does the word Christian mean in the first place? Sin. And so there are many, many uh, doctrines that I had that I had placed into these cold case files. Now this is just an example. I just brought with me an example. But I have, each box has its own uh, doctrine in it, has the, its own information in it. For example, the Sabbath. Why was the Sabbath moved from a Saturday to a Sunday? And so all the doctrines regarding that are written in these files. Why the Ten Commandments? Why did Christians stop obeying them? They're in here. So I have these files. Each subject has its separate file. And so I have these cold case files. Now you might be asking me, why did I call them cold case files? Because you see, as I was a Christian and as I was studying these cold case files, the more I studied the Bible and the more I started looking to, at these doctrines, I started finding there were 10, 20, 30, 40, 100, 200, 1,000, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 mysteries. And it's continuing to grow. They cannot be explained within the pages of the Bible. 
And so as these files began to grow and these boxes began to grow, I had to actually start marking them with reference numbers because I began to forget what box had what information in it. And so these boxes became bigger and bigger and bigger and more and more information was being searched for them. More and more information needed to be found to explain these mysteries, these cold case files. And so these cold case files today, they take up a huge area of my home. Mysteries that still to this day have not been explained. And I have spoken to great scholars and I have spoken to great theologians and they haven't been able to answer them. I've read many books, I've read many uh, explanations of the information within these cold case files and we still do not have the answers to them. Great scholars today are trying to find answers for them but they, all they can say is they can give you a suggestion or their view or their opinion on it but not solid concrete evidence. Perhaps 2,000 years from now or 3,000 years from now somebody will open these cold case files and perhaps they'll be able to answer them. We're going to take a short break and when we get back from the break I'm going to continue talking about these cold case files and the cold war that we're in. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. We are looking at the cold case files and the cold war that we are in. Now these cold case files that I was talking about in the first half were unsolved mysteries and they have remained unsolved mysteries even to this day. Many of the doctrines, the doctrine of the Trinity, doctrine of baptism, doctrines of repentance of sin, doctrine of grace, doctrine of law and I can name thousands of them that I have not been able to explain. If you became a member of your local church what happened is they said to you, if you want to be a member of the church, here are the doctrines that our church believes in. Some of you might have done your first Holy Communion or your catechism, or maybe you were baptized and you got a, a piece of paper very similar to this, and it said, these are the doctrines of the church. And when you were baptized, they asked you to sign a piece of paper, or they gave you a certificate to prove that you're a member of the church. So you agreed to these doctrines. However, some of the churches, maybe you only had 40 doctrines that you had to sign. But these doctrines all have sub-clauses. And so when I talk about these thousands of doctrines, there are doctrines that go further than just the basic doctrines that you had to sign when you became a member of your local church. So for a Christian, there are thousands of doctrines. There are thousands of beliefs, subsections within each belief. If baptism is essential for the repentance of sin, if somebody becomes a Christian, he must be baptized. Some religions believe that if you're not baptized, there's no way you can make it to paradise. So then what happened to the man that was on the cross? If we hear the story of the crucifixion, we have the crucifixion story as recorded in the Bible. We have Jesus in the center and two men on either side of him. The one man turns to Jesus. He's a repentant. He's sorry. And Jesus turns to him and says, Today you will be with me in paradise. So did the man have a chance to get off the cross? No, he didn't. So according to some Christian doctrine in some Christian churches, this person would not make it to paradise. But Jesus himself said you'll make it to paradise. So these are part of the doctrines. These are unsolved mysteries. These are things that do not have answers to. Christians today try to find answers. There are no answers to them. So what is the story now with the Quran? I have become a Muslim. I have accepted the Quran. How many cold case files do I have in my storeroom at home of unsolved mysteries in Islam? Now I would very much like to have a lie detector test here right now. I would like to have a polygraph test where I could show you that I have not one single file. Not a document, not a file anywhere with cold case and it's labeled or has a reference number that refers to Islam. There is nothing. My cold case file does not exist when it comes to Islam. What is a cold case file? Many of you looking at me and go, I don't know what a cold case file is. You've lost me already. A cold case file is an unsolved mystery. It's very similar to the X-Files, but the X-Files is unexplained phenomena. Cold case files are unexplained stories or cases that are still open. It means they open, the case is still open, it's pending and a solution. It's, it's pending somebody to discover, uh, waiting for somebody to come with the right answers and say this is what this cold case file means. So example, in the, in the military or the police or the, the security forces, the military, police, security forces, hospitals, sometimes they have a cold case file. It means they haven't been able to explain the mystery. Somebody died, maybe there was a murder and they can't solve the mystery. They put these into boxes, into the cold case file section and then a year or two years or five years later, somebody opens these files and tries to explain it. So like I said, my cold case files date back to the 1960s, 70s, 80s, and the 90s. And uh, during that time, I could not get answers for my mysteries. However, maybe somebody will come along one day and they'll be able to solve these mysteries and say, this definitely never happened. And then we'll be able to close that file and we'll be able to put it away for good. So when it comes to Islam, I have none of those cold case files. So 
What happened to me? I started to search for the truth and allowed the truth to set me free. So as I started reading through the Bible, I found that there were many verses in the Bible that told me about a group of people that I thought were my enemy. And this group of people that it told me about were Muslims. And I found that the more I read the Bible, the more I found that it was pushing me and directing me towards Islam. Now that might be a mystery or might be really difficult for some people to swallow. And then I'll say, what, a Bible leading people to Islam? Well, yes, there are many hundreds and hundreds of verses in the Bible that actually lead you to Islam. They lead you to the logical conclusion that you need to become a Muslim or Islam. Now, Islam and Muslim are very similar words. They basically belong together. You can't really separate them. Often people come to me and they say, I don't know what to call you. Do I call you an Islam or a Muslim? I said, either. It doesn't matter. They both mean the same thing. They both mean submitting to the will of God. And that's all the word means. It's a very easy word to understand. But we, instead of saying every single time submitting to the will of God, we just use the Arabic term Islam. You're welcome to use the words, the people who submit to the will of God, and that would be nice for us because sometimes we need to remember that. Sometimes we often forget that we are supposed to be submitting to the will of God. And so as people who submit to the will of God, I found that the Bible told me you need to submit to the will of God. So I found hundreds of thousands of verses that actually brought a link over towards Islam. And they actually it showed you this is how you're supposed to live as a Muslim. This is how you're supposed to submit to the will of God. And what we will do in upcoming episodes is we're going to look in depth. We're going to take a Bible, and you all need to get the following equipment to do this exercise. We're going to go through a Cold War, and we're going to have a look at verses and chapters. Every single book in the Bible we're going to go through, and we're going to find and underline and mark this Bible so we can use this as a kit when we go into, uh, into our combat war. Now, there's programs similar that have been done over the years called the Combat Kits. This is similar, but what we do, we're going to go into more depth, and we're going to be able to have this as a, a continuous guide to us so that when missionaries come knocking at our door, when evangelists come to our door, when Christian friends want to talk to you about Christianity, you can take this Bible and you're able to use it. So this is the following equipment that you're going to need in, in upcoming episodes. The equipment you're going to need are some highlighting pens. Now you can get five or six or seven different colors or one or two colors, it doesn't matter. It's good to have a whole different range of colors of highlighting pens so that you can uh, mark these verses in the Bible so that when you're talking you can immediately see yellow represented this, green represented this, pink represented this, blue represented this, and so on. Then try to get at least two or three different color pens, maybe a black pen, a blue pen, a red pen, and then you need something to do underlining with. You can use a ruler or anything that has a straight edge on it that we're going to underline and mark sections of the Bible with. The other thing that you're going to need, obviously, is a Bible. Now, to make it so we're all on the same page, the best Bible to get would be the King James Version. The reason I say the King James Version and not the other 1,999 different versions of the Bible that are available is because the King James Version is one of the first ones that was written. And because it was the one of the first ones written and the first ones out there for mankind to get hold of in the English language, it's the one that we're going to refer to the most. Yes, there are mistakes in it, but these are still in circulation today. So if there are, there's mistakes in every single version, by the way. But there are mistakes in the King James Version. That's the one they put forward first. This is the one they claim to be the Word of God. Anything that comes after that is also a Word of God, but then it's a Word of God revised and rechanged. So it cannot be. We have to decide which one is the Word of God. Is the King James the Word of God? Or in your international? Blah, 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 blah. All the different versions. We find that they're all a work in progress, but that's for another section and another talk. But what I'd recommend that you do is you get yourself a King James Version. Now, what are we going to do with this King James Version of the Bible once we finish with it? Once we finish with this King James Version, you've marked the entire Bible. We're going to uh, keep that copy in your home. So whenever anyone comes to you, you're able to speak to them uh, with knowledge. The second thing you're going to do is you're going to make a copy of that exact same book. And you're going to give it to a Christian. You're going to give it to somebody who has been maybe talking to you about Christianity maybe it's told you that you need salvation, you're going to give it to them and you're going to say to them, here my brother or here my sister, you're going to give it to someone else and you're going to say, here, I'm giving you this young man or young woman or older woman or older man and you give it to them and say, listen, I want you to look through here and I want you to see all the markings that I've made in this book, all the markings I've made in the Bible and I want you to come back to me with answers and to have a look at it, look and see what, how I've marked each section out and you come back and you ask your priest, or you ask your pastor, or you ask your minister to explain these verses to you. So what are we doing by this? We're doing two things. One is you're strengthening yourself and equipping yourself 
so that you know how to answer the Christian missionary or priests or Christian people that come to your house or, or meet you at school or college, wherever you are. And the second thing is you're giving them the ability to find the route, to find the way to Islam. Because all the markings that we're going to find in the Bible that we're going to mark also show people how to become a Muslim. They show verses that refer to Islam and show how we do as Muslims do things and how they should do things. And the other part of the Bible will be marked. It shows all the contradictions, absurdities, craziness, things that cannot be possibly be the word of God. So this is going to be exciting. We're going to go through each thing in detail. We're going to mark these things and we're going to have a look at uh, doctrines like original sin. Could it possibly be a doctrine that we should adhere to? Another thing as well that you need to get is perhaps a writing pad like this, something that you can write information on that you've learned along the way. Inside the front of the Bible, most of the Bibles, as you'll see in the next episode, they have places where you can write, blank pages, where you can write down notes that you get. Just like I did when I was a Christian, I used the Bible and I wrote down information in it. We're going to do this as Muslims. Now some people might think, well, hey listen, I've been told not to go near a Bible. We're not going near the Bible to learn from the Bible, convert you or change you. We're learning to understand the enemy. And what I mean by the enemy, I say this with the greatest respect. Because all those who are against God, anyone who tries to add another God with God is an enemy of God. God will not tolerate people who add other gods to him. Now the God we are talking about is the same God that the Bible is talking about. But unfortunately, people have come along the line and they've added other gods. They've added Jesus as God. They've added the Trinity to God. And uh, we'll have a look as we go further in the study in this program, inshallah, that people have even added a fourth or fifth or sixth or seventh person to the Trinity as the years have gone by. So this cannot be tolerated. God will not tolerate another God being associated with him. So God stands alone. So when we say the word enemy, we mean enemy of God. Enemy of the people who turn against God and want to fight against God and, and, and don't want to submit to God. The thing that we need to do is submit to God. So if you're a Christian or somebody who's new to Islam, this is going to help you because you're going to be able to see how your Bible, how your book says that you must, must submit to the will of God. And this Bible will naturally by itself lead over to Islam and it will show you how beautiful this Quran is. When you start reading the Quran, it will make so much sense. You don't find the contradictions. The challenge for 1,400 years has been to people to find the contradictions, to find any fault in it, and we have not yet found fault. No one has come forward. No one has said this is the fault that we find. So the same challenge we put to you today is uh, help. Let's get into this. Let's get strong. Let's, let's get knowledge. And so in the future episodes, when we come together, we'll be able to go episode by episode, have a look in detail how we can mark the, the Bible. So make sure you have all your documents together. Make sure you have all your things that you need. Remember, you need a Bible. You need some marker pens, pens, pencils, a ruler, some notepads, and we are going to get ready. If you want to get yourself a Bible, if you go to your local Christian or your local missionary, he, I'm sure he'll give you one for free. So you don't even have to go purchase these things. We're going to have that. We're going to go through it. We're going to mark it so you have your kit ready for you when you go into battle. So we're going to win this Cold War, and you're going to become a stronger Muslim and a stronger person by understanding the truth. I am Arib Islam. Until next time, Assalamu Alaikum.